So uh, welcome everyone, good afternoon. Um, thank you for joining us for this uh, session where we're going to be talking about um, a research project undertaken um, by Purdue University and Brigham Young University in the United States called Learning by Evaluating. Um, before we get going, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, the first thing is just to, uh, to advise you all that the session is being recorded um, and we're going to make the recording available uh, through the conference platform uh, next week for anyone who isn't able to join um, or if any of you want to uh, watch the session back again. Um, the second thing I'd ask is if you could make sure that your microphones are muted um, and your cameras are switched off, um, unless we get to a point where you want to ask a question, then obviously you can uh, rejoin us. Um, the camera being off is uh, helpful from a bandwidth perspective and obviously the microphone being muted just to make sure that we're not getting interrupted um, by any background noise. Um, we're very happy to uh, to take questions at any point through uh, the session. Um, you can do that either by popping the question in the chat um, and then we can address that um, as we go through. Um, or if you want to speak your question, um, then by all means, uh, turn your camera on um, and use the Teams function along the top bar there where you have the little uh, little smiley face holding the, the hand up icon um, just to raise your hand so that we know that you want to speak. Um, and we'll uh, we'll try and work that in. Um, we are going to have 10 minutes uh, Q&A at the end of the session, but as I say, very welcome uh, to take questions um, as we as we go through the session. Um, so um, so let's kick off. If I introduce myself, which I should have done right at the beginning, so remiss of me, apologies. So um, my name's Matt Wingfield. Um, I'm chief executive of the e-assessment association, and I also work as an independent consultant within the e-assessment space. Um, and um, that's why I'm here, I guess, in this guy's um, doing some work with uh, RM Education um, around this uh, learning by evaluating um, project. Um, I'm going to pass you over in a second uh, to uh, Dr. Scott Bartholomew and I'll let him introduce um, himself. Um, but as I say, questions for us as we go through, please pop them in the chat um, and we'll uh, either pick them up as you put them in um, or at the end of the session. Um, Scott, over to you. Uh, thank you, Matt. Good morning, everyone, or at least it's morning for me. Um, I, You have the distinct advantage over me in that I can't see you, but you can see me. So uh, like Matt said, please uh, feel free to ask questions anytime. And I have asked Matt to kind of uh, monitor the chat and uh, those functionalities. And and I'm not. Uh, it won't it won't bother me at all to have a question right in the middle. I think uh, if you've got something that's pertinent and and you really want to know more about, let's ask it so that we can uh, try and answer it right then while it makes the most sense. Um, by way of introduction, uh, like Matt said. My name is Scott Bartholomew. I am a professor of technology and engineering studies at Brigham Young University, and uh, which means that my role is primarily uh, in teacher education. So I uh, spend a lot of time out in the public schools observing our uh, teachers that are doing their student teaching or their internship experience. And uh, I teach a few classes here on campus related to education and pedagogy. Specifically, my backfield is in the design and technology space. Uh, I, prior to uh, being a professor here at Brigham Young University, I was a professor for four years at Purdue University in a similar role. And before that, I was a middle school teacher. And uh, so I have had uh, lots of classroom experience and uh, love working with the teachers, being out in the classrooms and, uh, you know, having those opportunities to work with the students and hopefully help them, you know, learn and grow. Um, I also want to introduce uh, my colleague, Dr. Nathan Menser. He's not able to be with us today, uh, but Dr. Menser is a professor at Purdue University in the Engineering Technology Teacher Program there. Uh, he has uh, a wealth of experience in professional development and teacher training, and he also leads the uh, Design Education Program at Purdue University. And so that's that's kind of the role that he plays. Uh, as I mentioned, not able to be with us today, but we're grateful that uh, he's been part of this project and I uh, want to recognize his contributions there. Uh, so just by way of a, an agenda, uh, we've done the introductions. I want to introduce you a little bit to the challenge that we uh, encountered in our classroom and uh, our hypothesis that we came up with. We'll talk about the approach that we tried out, uh, action-based research here, and the outcome and then the next steps. You know where where do we go from here? What what's the next the next thing look like for for this particular project? 
Okay, so the challenge and the hypothesis. At, at Purdue University, this is where this uh, research project originated. Uh, myself and Dr. Mincer were both professors who taught a similar course. We taught different sections of the course, but it was the same course, and you know he taught as sometimes and I taught sometimes. And this particular course is uh, geared towards freshman students who are pursuing a degree in the design and technology space. And all freshman students that are going to pursue a degree in that space have to take this course. And the, the basic premise behind the course is, can we give the students a design experience from start to finish, you know, where we, we come up with a problem, we identify the criteria, the needs, they go through some brainstorming, they go through some prototyping, all the way to the very end where they're, they're trying to come up with a solution to this problem. And that's, that's the basic premise. And all freshmen take this course. Um, Dr. Mincer and I both taught this course, and one day as we were discussing, we recognized that there was a common area that our students really struggled with. And that particular area was in the creation of what we call a point of view statement. And a point of view statement is really the, the crux of a design experience, because in the point of view statement, that's where the students would identify who they were designing for, who's the user. They would identify the need, you know, what, what's the problem that we're trying to solve. And they would identify some, some interesting or surprising insights that might lead them to, to design in a certain direction. Uh, but as, as he and I were discussing, we realized that even after having taught this class, you know, semester after semester for multiple years, uh, the point of view statement was something that our students really, really struggled with. And uh, it, it was just something that we, we didn't feel very good about. Um, and so that led us to uh, to really kind of look at this in, in a broader way and look at kind of multiple big questions. So number one, um, you know, thinking about this point of view statement, but thinking about the class in general, how how can we facilitate an impactful formative assessment experience across classes, because you know he taught some sections and I taught some sections, um, but in addition to both of us as instructors, we also had a team of about five other instructors. And so we came up with some ideas, but but I wanna focus on that last one. We wanted to, to really find something that we could put into our class that didn't add significantly to the teacher workload. You know, we talked about, well, we can meet with the students individually and, and try and dive into these one on one. Uh, but but this this course is taken by about 600 students each semester with seven teachers. That's that's quite a heavy workload if, if we were to try and take an approach like that. So what we really you know, the crux of what we said, you know, can we can we design something that's useful in this space um, is, is can we can we come up with an idea? an approach, you know, something to try that empowers students to learn independently, but helps them to understand what good quality work looks like so that they can improve their own learning outcomes. And, and I want to talk a little bit about this, the middle bubble there you can see on your screen. So many of our students, um, we would we would tell them, you know, we need you to do a point of view statement. And uh, as the as the professor, we'd stand at the front of the room and we'd write, you know, these are the elements. There's a user, there's a need, there's an insight. We would practice together, you know, who are some users? What are some needs? What are some insights? We talk it through so that we had some direct instruction. But what we realized is that uh, for for many of the students, they really didn't have a grasp on what what good was. You know, how, how, well, how good does this need to be? I don't I don't really know what it looks like. And, and this is something in my research that I've discovered with a lot of teachers. Um, they they'll assign their students something generally a, a more open ended task. You know, we're going to try and tackle one of the UN's big world problems or or even something simple like we're going to have you design a, a new bicycle seat. But the students, when it's not concrete, the students can really struggle to to kind of set the bar of well, well what is good and what does that look like and how good is good enough you know most uh, that's a question i get from my students all the time well well how long does it need to be you know what does it need to look like and so and this was a problem that the students had with the point of view statements because for most of them they never created 
a point of view statement before uh, they they didn't they didn't have any grasp of well is it is this thing that i'm making a paragraph long is it three sentences long is it one sentence long how specific does it need to be how generic does it need to be they, they just they didn't really understand what you know what good was so here's what uh here's here's what we decided to do okay we we decided we would try something a little bit different something that was based on uh, some of the research that 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 i've been i've been doing for a few years and and that builds on the research of others um and the ambition of this challenge because we were dealing with so many students you know 600 students across 12 different sections of class with seven different instructors um it is a pretty ambitious approach, you know, something that we felt like we needed some help with. And so this is where I want to point out uh, the key partners in in our particular endeavor here. Um, obviously, uh, Nathan Menser's at Purdue University, OK, which is which is where I was before I moved to Brigham University. And that's where I am now. And then uh, we partnered up with RM Compare, who uh, really has facilitated the software or provided kind of the, the backing to uh, to make this whole thing possible uh, and i apologize i'm going to have to just blow my nose real quick so i'm going to mute and then i'll join you in just one second apologies it's uh it's just barely 7 a.m here so i'm still still uh, getting my win for the day all right let's look at uh the approach that we've got going here this is what we did okay so uh, as I mentioned, about 550 engineering undergraduate students, the vast majority of them freshmen, okay, brand new students to uh, Purdue University, and uh, design thinking course, okay. For many of them, their first opportunity to really tackle a big design problem, to come up with a prototype, to come up with a solution, and go through all of that. Uh, what we did is we we really wanted to test the efficacy of this particular uh, intervention. And so we took all the students and we split them into two equivalent groups. The way that we split them is we split them by teacher. Okay, and that was important because research shows that the instructor of a course is the single largest influence on how the students do. And uh, so we didn't feel like it was fair to take, you know, the good teachers and do one thing and the bad teachers and do one thing, but every single instructor taught two sections and we had them try our little intervention with one and then with the other section, they just proceeded as normal. Uh, so you can see on there on the screen, control group taught as normal. The compare group, which, which would be our treatment or our comparison group, okay, uh, was exposed to a single intervention that lasted less than 20 minutes. Typically, it was about 10 minutes at the very beginning of the module. And, and this particular intervention, I'll, I'll go into more detail, but simply involved the students looking at previously submitted work, so from previous years, comparing it and identifying which was better. And, and I'll talk a little bit about that, but but very, very simple exercise they went through. It took about 10 minutes up to 20 at the very most. Uh, and so you can see right there that the intervention group, they used RM Compare, which is uh, a software that facilitates comparative judgments. And they were able to look at point of view statements that had been turned in in previous years. We've taught this course for many years. We have a big bank of you know statements that we've collected across the years. And uh, the nice thing was because this experience was facilitated through the RM Compare software, uh, it really was very minimal effort required on the teacher. Okay, we had the students log in to some online software. As soon as they logged in, they started to see items displayed uh, point of view statements they chose the one they thought was better they did that about five or six times and they were done okay so let's let's talk a little bit about what uh you know what's the basis why did we decide to do this why did we decide to have students compare work from previous years and, and use rm compare software and things like that um, and it really goes back to this idea of the law of comparative judgment. And this has been around uh, since the 1920s. Uh, it, you know, it, it's been around for a long time. It started with by a man by the name of Thurstone and uh, 
kind of kicked around for a little while until another researcher uh, out of Cambridge by the name of Paulet uh, started looking at it. And um, it uh, anyway, it, this is the this is the basic idea. If I were to ask my students to look at a point of view statement and to give it a grade between zero and 100, um, I would likely get a whole range of scores from my students. Somebody might think it's 100, somebody might think it's a zero, and any number in between. Um, and any time we do a subjective decision like that, we try to pinpoint the relative quality of an item, uh, it can be very difficult. That's why when you go to the eye doctor, uh, they don't ask you to look at a, a piece of paper or a poster and identify the exact prescription that is right for you. That, that would be very, very difficult for us to do. Rather, you know, they put the little thing on your head and they show you this one and they show you this one and, and they say, well, is this better or is this better? Is this better? Is this better? And that, that leverages our natural ability to make judgments very accurately between items. If we look at two things, we can say, well, that one's better than that one. We may not be able to say how much better, but we feel very confident in saying this is better than this. Um, and so this law of comparative judgment is the kind of the underlying principle behind RM Compare. As I mentioned earlier, RM Compare is the software interface that facilitates these comparisons. And um, what we what we found in other research, which led us to this project, is that if we ask students to compare items side by side, um, they start to develop a, a sense of what good looks like. And uh, further, when we ask them to look at two items side by side and choose the one that they think is better, we can also ask them to tell us why. Why do you think this particular item is better than this item? You know, what is it that's, that's making that stand out to you? And, and that provides some rich insight for us into what the students are thinking. So let me show you what, what the student experience looked like, okay? As I mentioned, our control group, they did classes normal. The teachers taught them about point of view statements. They did some exercises and they created them. Our treatment group, the teachers taught them about uh, point of view statements. They did some exercises. And then right before they started creating them, they did this little 10 minute intervention where they logged into compare. And you can see right there on the screen what it looked like. And they simply saw two point of view statements side by side. And there's a little prompt up there that says, a strong point of view statement includes these things, a user, a need, and an insight. Which one do you think is better? And so then the students would read A and they read B and they choose whichever one they thought was the better point of view statement. It, based on what they just learned in class, based on what the instructor taught them, and based on that little prompt we have there at the top that says, hey, just as a reminder, these are the things that a point of view statement should have. Now, as the students made those judgments, you know, so in this particular instance, let's say the student chose A, okay, a little box would pop up and say, why did you choose A? What was it about A that that made you think it was better? And uh, I, I, as a teacher, I love I love this exercise because it forces my students to think, but then also to articulate their learning or their understanding. What was it about A that made A better than B? And so they have to sit and think and and they start to use the vocabulary that we've discussed, discussed in class. They start to tie what I just barely taught them to what they're seeing and to a judgment of quality. They tie those all together and they have to put it into words. And, and this is what we, we asked the students to do. Like I mentioned, it was very, very brief, about 10 minutes. They viewed anywhere between five to eight pairs of items and then they moved on and they created their own point of view statements. Um, and we did that with all the students. Control group went through, made them. Okay, and then we have our uh, experimental group that went through, made them as well. And then what we did is the students worked on these together in their groups and then they submitted their final point of view statement. And uh, we, we needed some way to, to identify if our intervention was impactful, right? You know, what, what, what happened? So what we did was we took all of the point of view statements that these students had created because that's what they'd been learning about. That's what they had done some comparing of. And we put them into two new um, RM compare sessions. One 
that was assessed by the by all the teachers of the course, so all seven teachers, and a second one that was assessed by all the students of the course. OK, and uh, these were all blinded so that there was no names on it or class periods or anything. So there was no way that that could have been influential in the outcomes. Um, and here's what we found. We're really excited uh, to have found that. Number one, there was a significant difference between the LBE students and LBE is a, a little term that I a little you know acronym that I've coined for learning by evaluating. This is our students that went through this process of comparing. There's a significant difference between them and the control group. Uh, you can see I've got T values and P values there. I don't know if that's important or not to you. Uh, it depends on maybe your statistical acumen, but um, they did much better. Seven of the top 10 students were from the learning by evaluating group. You know, and you can see that in that little graph, that's the red. The red group is all of our students that got this little intervention where they just controlled items for 10 or they just compared items for 10 minutes. The blue group is our control group. OK, and you can see there's a, a pretty, pretty stark contrast there that seven out of the top 10 came from our experimental group, and that's according to the teacher assessment. According to the student assessment or the student compare judgment that they did at the end, uh, all 10 out of the top 10 were from that experimental group. The difference was practically significant, and I, I put practically significant there because that's a statistical term for Cohen's D, suggesting that um, <coughs> this will make a big impact in the classroom. Items in educational research that demonstrate practical significance are worthy of consideration worthy of like, hey, we need to pay attention here. We, we've got to we've got to look at this and, and see what we're going to do. Two thirds of the control group were below. So this is the group that didn't get to do the comparisons. They ranked below the average person in our intervention group. Okay, so, so this is pretty significant. OK, and uh, let me sorry, let me stop on this slide right here. We found that there was four reasons that this was significant. Number one, the students learned <coughs> while they were making comparisons. There's something about having to decide between two items that solidifies uh, the, the principles and concepts in their own mind. Number two, as the students saw items from a previous year, it helped them understand what good looks like. They started to kind of establish the bar of like, OK, this is what I need to do, OK? Number three, we asked the students to provide a rationale. You know, why did you decide this item versus this other item? Okay, and by forcing them to articulate that, um, it it really they had to solidify their own understanding enough that they could then put it into words. And that is an important learning process. There's some scaffolding that happens and some metacognition that happens and, and some things that, that really help them to, to learn and grow. And, and last but not least, we had them do this multiple times. So they didn't just compare one item, but they compared multiple items. And each time they further refined their own understanding of, of what a good one was. So what are our next steps? Where do we go from here? We, we found this thing and, and what do we do next? Uh, we took this these results and we actually um, submitted for a one and a half million dollar National Science Foundation grant and uh, it was funded and we've just started that. We're working with a, a large school district down in Georgia in DeKalb County and uh, it's a three year study where we are testing this across the district with many, many teachers and lots and lots of students. Um, and, and the goal is to say, well, we found that this was impactful. Well, can we take it and really use it at scale? Uh, the nice thing about the software interface is you can scale it indefinitely, right? Any number of students could be added to to the particular software. Um, but we are we have just started this semester with these teachers. We're really excited to to move forward and piloting this at a much bigger scale in the K-12 space. And uh, we'll be happy to share some results. Uh, you know, as we have them, but as I mentioned, it, it just barely started, but we're really excited to have received the report we or the support that we did from the National Science Foundation. I'm going to go ahead and pass back over to Matt um, and he's going to talk about just a few other aspects and things that that are, are interesting and applicable, I think, to this idea of, of helping students to learn by evaluating.
Thanks, Scott. That was great. Um, and yeah, I, I, I wanted to touch on a couple of things. That the first is to say that whilst Scott's project was very focused around design and getting students to um, evaluate point of view statements, um, the the approach, the the comparative judgment approach, can be used with any kind of work. And indeed, the software, the RM Compare software that that Scott and his colleagues used, uh, can be used with video, pictures. Um, you know, scanned um, handwritten text, anything you want to throw at it, audio files um, can be can be put into this um, pairwise comparison um, interface um, to allow um, students to get a better understanding of what good looks like in the particular learning context that they're in. So that could be because they're writing an essay, it could be they're creating a project, anything that's open ended. Um, where there's a, a potential for subjectivity, I guess, in the understanding of what the student's um, uh, understanding is um, in relation to what good looks like. And one of the, 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 the really interesting things that the, the software also facilitates, in, in addition to, to allowing it uh, this, uh, this approach to scale, is insight into how the students, in this case, have um, interacted through their judgments with 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 the with the pieces of work and what you're seeing on the screen at the moment is a, a statistical representation of um, a, a group of students who have used the software um, to make some judgments around pairs of of, of work um, each student is represented by um, the little blue dots and in addition to giving you an idea of, of where you fall in the group. So what we're seeing here is a view of consensus, if you like. So everyone in that sort of white band in the middle um, is roughly in consensus with each other. So it's showing me that I'm in rough consensus with everyone else's views, which is a useful thing. But even more useful from the teacher's perspective is it's showing us that the student, which is the one single dot in the blue band, who has a slightly different view on, on the comparisons that they've been making. And that might be because they haven't fully understood what good looks like in that particular context. It might be that they've got a slightly different take on the work, but what it's doing through this statistical analysis is just highlighting to the teacher that it might be worth having a conversation with that student to make sure that they've got a good grasp of, of what it is that you want them to do. So in addition to giving the, the students this, this ability to make these pairs compared comparisons, the tool's also giving teachers insight into how the students are undertaking those comparisons so that they can help support and provide that additional um, uh, support, I guess, in, in, to those students who really need it, um, which is, you know, is, is a key thing for us to understand as teachers. So, Scott, if we can move on to the next the next slides, go on again. Um, it's not just in the context of Scott's work that this uh, approach has been used. Um, the overall approach that the RM Compare used is it uses is called adaptive comparative judgment, which is a bit of a mouthful, so ACJ um, for short. Um, it's been around for a long time. Uh, the, the piece of software was originally conceived um, through a research project uh, run by the University of London back in uh, 2008. Um, has been used in a variety of different contexts. You can see some examples there, um, including um, the SQA, who've used it um, very successfully um, in, around some the assessment of, of higher uh, um, essays um, in various subjects um, in all sorts of different countries, in lots of different subject areas. Uh, we've got a whole bunch of, of primary schools uh, using it in England now to um, support the moder teacher moderation of, of written work. Um, we've also got it being used by, by a number of UK universities in some scientific subjects um, for helping students uh, run peer assessment activities um, to get a better understanding of how they can improve their own work. And what I thought it might be helpful to do um, is to share um, a little bit of a, an insight into what students think about this approach. So a few years ago, uh, we ran a project using uh, using the tool for, for several years with the University of Edinburgh, um, where, where the students were undertaking peer assessment activities around essays that they were writing uh, with a view of understanding how they could improve their work moving forward. And we've got a very short video uh, to play now uh, with one of those where one of those students tells you a little bit about what she found out um, through the process and what she thought of this ACJ approach, which um, is the is the underlying approach to the RM Compare software. So Scott, if you could play the video, that would be fantastic. Hi, my name is Brianna Pagano. I'm a recent graduate of the University of Edinburgh and I completed the Edinburgh Award in June as a student ambassador for North American Recruitment and Admissions. I'm now currently president of Edinburgh University Students Association. 
and so we went through this process of actually writing essays um, to articulate why we should receive the award and through that we used ACJ to mark our essays. We went through a first round where we'd get used to the, to the system and start to receive feedback and get a sense of whether or not we were giving you know, um, concise enough feedback. And then the second round we could use the feedback we received from our peers to actually strengthen our essays. And the wonderful thing about the ACJ approach is that you get collaborative feedback from everyone in the cohort and it basically it provides you with one positive and one negative that gave you so many different perspectives on, on this feedback you're receiving. And it can be likened to a crowdsourcing approach because everyone was coming together, you're receiving different perspectives and it was really positive. And the fantastic thing was that it was in context, it was really quick feedback. And because I was working with my peers that were kind of working within the same context, I really got meaningful feedback and it was unlike feedback I would have received anywhere else. And I think because I was part of that process and I was really starting to understand how those, how that feedback was, was coming forward. I certainly understand more about my own work, but even more importantly, I understand the process that our lecturers and tutors go through and how they will see our work and rank it and mark it. And that was actually really, really important. Had I known that at the beginning of my degree, I might've been writing my essays or completing my work slightly differently. So it was really meaningful for me to see how my work was being assessed and compared um, to others. And I think that point that Brianna makes at the end there is is really interesting. So that going through this peer review process of using the, the comparative judgment approach, it gave her a much better sense of what her teachers really wanted her to do. Um, and, that you know, as she says, if she'd known that at the beginning of her degree, she'd have been doing that her work in a very different way um, if she'd known that. And I think, you know, that's a really interesting thing, because often as teachers, and, and if I think back to when I was a primary school teacher, one of the biggest challenges is helping our students to understand what we want them to do. And that can be you know, exponentially more difficult if it's an open ended task like writing a piece of creative writing or um, writing an essay or creating a, an open ended project. And that's where this process of allowing students to see successive pairs of their peers work, um, either from the point of view of giving feedback on how that work can be improved or just to help them understand how to improve their work can be a really valuable exercise. If you are interested in finding out more about um, uh, the research work that, that Scott has uh, has undertaken, I'm going to pop some of these links in the chat. So there's a, a link there to the uh, to the full um, evaluation, uh, sorry, the full research paper. Uh, there's also a, a four minute overview video um, of the research um, that just gives you a little more information um, about um, what Scott and his colleagues did. Um, we're also holding um, an interactive webinar, uh, which Scott will be joining us for on the 30th of, of this month, uh, where you'll actually be able to have a chance to get involved in using the software. Um, so, you know, please do join us for that. You do need to register in advance so that we can set you up with access to the software, um, but please do uh, join us for that if you want to find out more um, or if you want to have a play um, with the software. The other thing that I think is really um, useful to, to note is that RM um, provide a, um, a free trial uh, for the software, for the RM Compare software, um, which I'm going to pop the link in, in, in the, the chat to there as well, and which you can use to, to have a play with the software. There's, there's no time limit to, to using the software. Um, all, the only limitation is that you can set up three a maximum of three assessment sessions if you like um, but it's fully functional allows you to um, have a real uh, go at using the software with students um, to help them understand how this all works if you do have questions um, then you know you might might not want to put them um, into the chat now but 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 please do we'll come to questions um, in, a, in a second more generally um, but our email addresses are on the screen too. Scott's is there, mine is there. Um, please do feel free um, to ask us um, if you do have any follow-up questions. We're also going to be on the um, RM stand um, after in the exhibition area after the after this presentation. So please do come along and, and join us if you'd like to ask anything. Um, Scott is actually teaching in 25 minutes, so he's only going to be with us for a very short space of time, um, but I'll be around um, for much of the rest of the afternoon and be very happy to um, ask any questions. The final thing I wanted to uh, to mention um, is a little bit of a plug for the e-assessment association. As I said at the beginning, I'm chief executive of the association. Um, we've got now about 3,000 members um, across 
uh, the UK and internationally, um, right across the education spectrum. It's a, 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 an association that's all about um, propagating and helping support a better understanding of how technology can be used to support formative and summative assessment. It's completely free to join. So if this is an area that you're interested in, if you want to find out more about projects like Scott's been talking about, then please do um, join up. Um, you simply go to the uh, to the address shown on the screen there, um, and it takes literally two minutes um, to become a member. And you then receive um, a quarterly newsletter and access to case studies and a, a supplier uh, directory. So really worthwhile doing if you can. And Scott, if you can take us to the last slide. So yeah, thank you. Um, really grateful for your time in joining us for this session. Um, I don't know whether anyone's got any any specific questions that they'd like to ask. I've got a couple that I thought might be of general interest, which um, Scott and I can chat about um, now. Um, but if you do have questions, please do pop them in the chat or, as I say, raise your hand and we'll happily happily bring you in. So, Scott, what, what, one of the questions just to, to kick us off in, in this. Um, I was interested, and, 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 I, and of course, I'm asking these questions knowing some of the answers, so, so apologies. But um, the work that you were sharing with the students in so the, the prior cohort work that you were sharing at the point of view statements, were they all good examples um, or was, was it a mixture? Yeah, great question. Um, it, it was a mixture. So it was just we just pulled work that had been turned in the previous year. So some of it was uh, of a higher quality than other items, obviously, uh, some of it being really good and some of it being quite poor. Um, but uh, on that note, we actually just did a follow up study at Purdue um, because I had I had the hypothesis that, well, what if you know, we found that this is a, an impactful learning thing? What if we only showed students good work or we only showed them bad work? You know, could we maybe influence how they did? Um, and uh, the long and the short of it is we tried this again with another, you know, a new semester, a new cohort of 600 students, and we showed we showed some students only good items in the comparisons. Some students saw only poor items, and then some students saw a mixture of good and bad items. And um, but what we found, which was surprising to me, is that there was no difference at all. Uh, the difference lies in going through the process of comparing and not so much in what it is that they compare. And I think that goes back to my original, you know, those the four items that I identified where there's some learning that happens by having to look at two items, choose one that's better, and then say why it's better. And that appears to be more impactful than, you know, what it is they're looking at per se. Yeah, no, that's really interesting, isn't it? And, and I guess it makes sense because if we if we stop and we, think about what makes something better um, particularly when we're, when we're looking at two things which as we said as you said earlier on is, is, a, is a much easier process to do we are um, internalizing and, and and putting a lot of thought into that process so it, it's bound to to have an impact and, and i know this is another question that lots of people ask so is it as simple as just putting these sets of work up in front of the students or do you give them some guidance on on what your um, anticipated uh, expectations around what a good point of view statement looks like and, and how does that if you do how does that get um, you know um, related to the students yeah, yeah so I think I think you could just give it to them and have them try it but um, but I don't know that that would be as impactful as what we did which is there was some direct instruction from the teacher that kind of provided a common understanding around these are some elements of what a good point of view statement looks like it should have this and this and this and so what that did was that established a common set of vocabulary for the students. And and it wasn't necessarily one that they were super comfortable with, but it, at least it was common. But what we noticed is as they used that common set of vocabulary and understanding to evaluate and provide some feedback, they then became more fluent to use, you know, a language term, more fluent and able to use that vocabulary because they're now starting to take it and say oh, hey, I just learned about composition and this is an example of composition and now I've used it in a sentence and now I can, I'm okay, I'm comfortable with that. Yeah, no, okay, that's interesting. And, and, and I'm, I'm also right in saying, aren't I, that the software enables you to display some criterion that you want the students to use when they're making their decisions just to help guide their thought process. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
so great thank you for that um and, and I suppose so another another obvious question is so you know and, and and I'm slightly biased I've been involved in the use of this particular piece of software since 2008 so so for a long time but why did you choose this particular piece of software because there are other comparative judgment software available why rm compare what what, what was most appealing about that for you yeah, so um, I, I and I've been using it not for as long as you, Matt, but I've been using it for a while because I kind of started playing around with this back when I was doing my dissertation. But um, I, there are there are multiple options as far as comparative judgments. You know, there's uh, there's some uh, some ones that well, most of them have come out of kind of Europe, UK type area. Um, but what, what I found is that the the RM compare software is is just very accessible for students as far as a kind of a clean, easy interface. Um, it's it's simple to set up a session. It's simple to run a session. And then uh, the probably the biggest difference is the results are displayed in a very user friendly way. And so, you know, when I'm using this with other teachers who maybe don't have the same background, uh, I found that that it's an approachable piece of software. Uh, I mean, all all hosted online, right? You don't have to download anything, but um, it's very approachable and easy for them to use, and so that's why that's why we took this this one and we put this one into play here. And, and that's important, isn't it? Because because ultimately, at the end of the day, you want the teachers who are running these sessions. It's it's not it is about absolutely making sure the students get a better understanding of what good looks like, but it's also about giving teachers insight into the the rich um, data that sits behind the results from them doing their judgments that helps them understand which students need more help and, and which students have got it and you know can can press ahead to the next uh, the next stage so, uh, so yeah, no, that's exactly and, and then finally because we, we, we've just got a couple of minutes left um, what advice would you give to someone who was thinking about having a go at running this kind of session themselves setting it up in their own classroom um, using you know this software and the learning by evaluating approach any advice that you'd give them yeah well what i what i talk to most teachers about who, who are interested is i tell them this is something you're probably already doing you know good teachers usually use examples and and provide that opportunity for students to compare and and really doing something like this is just taking something that you're already doing and formalizing it a little bit you know putting it through a piece of software or actually kind of saying you know we're going to take the time as a class to now do this um, but we've done this with lots, lots of different teachers in a lot of different places and we have found very very promising results um, i'd be happy to share more with anyone that that might be interested but um, yeah i, I think don't, don't be intimidated by the fact that in this study i shared you know we had 600 students and da, 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 da. I, I think this works just as great with a small class and uh and oftentimes it's something that you're already using with your students. It's just formalizing that approach. Yeah, and, and I suppose another important point to make, which sort of leads on from that, is that whilst this particular study was with undergraduate first year students, um, you've also used this approach with elementary schools, with with middle schools. And I know Nathan, is, who's a, a high school teacher, has, has, has explored options there, too. And, and indeed, the, the project in Atlanta is with with high school students. So, you know, there's there's no there's no reason why you should limit the use of this to one particular uh, part of the education sector. This could be applicable to, uh, to a whole range of different ages of students. Yeah, exactly. Fantastic. Well, listen, we're just coming up to uh, the end of the session. Scott, thank you so much for joining us at a very unsociable hour. I know you had to, to get up at 5.30 this morning in order to be in in, in, in the university in time because you're teaching in, in 15 minutes time. So we need to, to let you go and get ready for that. Um, but thank you again for joining us. Um, really nice to, uh, to have everyone join us here. Uh, just a reminder that the session's been recorded and will be available via the conference platform uh, next week. And please do come to find out more about what Scott's been talking about, come along to the RM stand in the exhibition area uh, where I'll be available to, to chat for most of the rest of the afternoon and Scott will be available uh, for a short amount of time too. So come and join us and, and find out a little bit more. Thanks very much.